Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, coming your way with some Georgia Tech talk here at uh, 11 o'clock Eastern time on a Friday, striking up the live stream as we typically do. We've got uh, Ken Siguera from um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution joining us uh, to talk the Yellow Jackets. Ken, we appreciate you uh, stopping by. My pleasure. So, man, this is a football team that's been on a roller coaster ride the last yeah. few seasons. Mm -hmm. So you win the Orange Bowl and then drop to three wins, come back with nine wins and drop back to five and six. Um, your your thoughts about uh, initially before we really dig into the personnel about the uh, 2018 edition? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the 15 season kind of came out of the blue. They were hit with a ton of injuries. I think obviously people are expecting a lot more. Um, last year, um, it was just kind of a, a weird season. I don't know what you remember about them, but they lost – to Tennessee uh, in Mercedes-Benz on that double overtime game, a game they really should have won. They lost to Miami, um, like another last-second game. Uh, they had that, you know, Miami, that kind of funky tip fourth down pass when they were kind of winning everything. Uh, they lost to Virginia kind of the same way. Um, so it was one of those seasons that, yeah, that I suppose a lot of teams could say the same thing. But it's one, yeah, you could have easily been an eight-win team um, even a nine-win team, if 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 things bounce a little better, and, and some of that just goes back to the team and the coaching of you've got to be not, you know put yourself, make sure you're not in those situations and, and execute when you need to. But uh, but yeah, it was uh, kind of yeah, a roller coaster is a, a good way to put it. You you know, Ken, uh, is this a program that we see elsewhere and even in professional sports? when they they build a certain core together and they're able to put some things together and hit the schedule just right that they can have a big season and then mm -hmm. it cycles through and they may have to suffer through uh, you know they're not going to typically go three and nine that was a complete right. aberration based on what right. paul johnson's produced there but maybe some lesser seasons and that's just going to be the deal at georgia tech i, th I think that's exactly it uh you look at just i mean they're Recruiting typically isn't that high, so they're not going to have, you know, all the studs. They're going to just kind of win games on their own. So they're going to need – typically, like the 14 season is a perfect example. They had a ton of seniors. They were kind of – the chemistry was right. They, they've been kind of, you know, middle of the road the past couple of years, and they were kind of sick of it. They had a quarterback, Justin Thomas, who was the, the best that, that Paul Johnson's had there. And so everything kind of coalesced. They, they got in a run, uh, you know, one – you know, actually it's funny, you know, the games they lost last year – uh, were kind of some of the ones they won, particularly the Georgia game. I think of that uh, that really kind of, that kind of hit. So, um, so yeah, that that's you know that really kind of is who Georgia Tech is. They they're you kind of you're kind of hoping, I guess, for for everything to kind of coalesce together, cycle right, the schedule hits, and you get some bounces and and you end up with a nine ten win season. Yeah, because there's few programs in the country that uh, do it as well as they do if you believe in recruiting rankings. And I think the recruiting rankings, the higher you get, the the more they tell the story and are accurate. You right. start to drop back into the 40s and 50s, and it uh, depends on development. And we see the Wisconsin's and Michigan States do it at a high level. We see the right. Georgia Techs and the service academies and a few other programs do it at a certain level, Kansas State. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, in whether you look at the the plus side or the the glass half full or half empty, you can uh, uh, credit Paul Johnson for player development, or you can knock him on recruiting. I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's what, you kind of got to pick one. I mean, if you yeah, if if they're you know even above five hundred with with you know classes that are at the bottom of the ACC, then you got to say, well, he's he's doing something right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of kind of factors that go into why tech's recruiting is the way it is. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think they, they do a really good job by and large with what they have for sure. We were talking Georgia tech football with Ken Sierra from uh, the Atlanta journal constitution and uh, glad to have him on the show for the first time here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We've got uh, LSU with uh, Matt Moscona from ESPN Radio at 1145 and some Penn State talk at 2 Eastern time this afternoon with Black Shoe Diaries of SB Nation. So, uh, Ken, when you look at this particular team and you made the uh -huh. reference to Justin Thomas and he did it just about as well as you're going to see a triple option quarterback do it in the passing game slash running game. Uh, throwing for 50 percent so you hit those downfield throws and you yeah, hit right. for 50 percent and you're good we see right. take one marshall for all the good things he did last year was a 37 percent passer i right. gotta think that that's been an emphasis 
Uh, yeah, very much so, even going back to the spring. Uh, I mean, Taquan himself was working on technique and, and uh, you know, staying in the pocket. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, obviously it's it's not the kind of opportunity you want, but I think there's there's a little more that goes into it. The, the pass protection wasn't very good. They played some really good defenses toward the end of the season. And, uh, you know, they played a lot of games in, in bad weather where it was tough to complete some passes. And obviously, yeah, some, you know, some goes on him too. But uh, I know he spent a lot of time this summer and, like I said, back in the spring, kind of getting more of a, a connection with the receivers and kind of committing himself to staying in the pocket and not, you know, not skirting out and, and throwing on the run. Um, so, yeah, I, I would, you know, you know, the, the offensive line is mostly back. So you would think that some of their protection issues will, will be uh, healed up. So I would, I would suspect that that'll, that'll be a better and improved facet of, of the game. The one thing is they lose rookie June, who has, has been the go-to receiver both for Taquan and for Justin uh, Thomas before him. So they got to find one or two guys that they really can trust. But, uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, you'd have to think they're going to get better. And that's the other statistical anomaly about this style of offense for mm-hmm. statistical nerds like myself, is you uh, see the, the one wide receiver who catches right. almost everything and usually catches it for 20 or 22 yards a clip, which right. is really, really good. And that was Ricky June, 25 catches out of 43 receptions for the entire team last year. So uh, do we have any idea who's going to step into that role? There's uh, probably a couple options. Um, Brad Stewart, who's a two-year starter now, he'll be back. Um, and then um, Jalen Camp is is a likely other starter. Uh, you know, one thing I've heard, and you know, I, I, maybe this is just talk, but you know, they you know, Paul Johnson mentioned that I think too, and I heard it from Brad also that you know maybe you don't have a go-to receiver and that you, you just throw it to the other guy. I mean, I, I guess it kind of makes sense, but you kind of throw it to whoever is getting open and whoever is kind of kind of feeling of that game. And so maybe that's maybe they do a little differently that year. That really hasn't been the case, as you said. I mean, you look back over the you know the ten seasons that you've been here, Paul Johnson, and they they typically had one guy that's stood out. But uh, but if it was gonna be someone, you know, it'd probably be Brad or, or Jalen. Um, Jalen Camp is he's uh, he's only caught one pass in two years, but he's got good size, uh, really strong, um, you know, pretty decent speed, and so uh, so that that might be it. But uh, you know, time will tell. You know, Ken, you mentioned uh, 2017 being an odd season. Uh, the 12th game was missed, and it was right. a <laughs> what it would have been a very interesting affair yes. because yeah. Central Florida taking on another Power Five, and even though Georgia Tech wasn't on top of its game, it would have been most likely a, a decent football game, and so that may have cost them postseason play. Possibly, mm-hmm. uh, they finished five and six, and because of that, they were a bit off the radar. And Carvante Benson may be the the less are known of thousand yard backs uh, across the nation. And he was able to do that with not the best of offensive line play last year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny it, the college football is funny for a lot of reasons, but one being that, you know, a year ago at this time, almost exactly a year ago, I wouldn't have thought he was going to play at all. All the Diedrich Mills was returning leading rusher had done really well as a freshman, but was dismissed from the team. And and now you're thinking like, what can this kid do? He didn't even play early at all. I'd be back as a freshman, and now he's going to be the starter. And he was, yeah, he was kind of a surprise. Uh, you know, really strong lower legs, uh, kind of kind of quick and slippery. Um, not the best top end speed, but yeah, a, kind of a really good fit for that position. And so he comes back. You think again with you know the line coming back and him having his more experience that that he's going to be a better, more productive running running back. He's lost a little bit of weight, which he thinks will help make help him be a little more agile and, and, and fast. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, you know, he and Taquan Marshall both ran for a thousand yards. You'd think that, you know, just again, with the, with the benefit of experience and, and other pieces around them, that they should be, be able to do that again. So it's, uh, that's one thing that definitely bodes well for, for what this offense can do uh, this season. We go to the Atlanta Atlanta Journal Constitution, one of the trusted sources for sports and news information, certainly for a long, long time. And uh, Ken Siguera, who joins us uh, covering Georgia Tech football, the boys are in camp. And uh, of course, it's always an interesting take uh, for an offense that's um, in addition to the service academies, they are the the standard uh, when right. it comes to running this offense. Uh, let's turn to the defense. Ted Roof has been uh, a mainstay on the defensive side of the football. Then you bring in uh, Nate Woody from App State. What can we expect differently from a defense that's been fairly mediocre in recent years? <laughs> yeah, that, that'd probably be a way to put it. Um, 
I think the one thing that, you know, I've heard Paul Johnson say over and over and over, even preceding Nate Woody, is he wants something that's simple, excuse me, even preceding Ted Roof, uh, is he wants something that, that's simple and aggressive and that allows players to play fast. And, uh, and you know, I, I think just, you know, we haven't obviously seen them out in the field yet, but it seems like this might be a really good fit. They play a 3-4 defense. Um, it's said to be, Simple, you know. Players have talked have talked about being able to grasp it pretty pretty quickly, and uh, I think yeah. Just but from hearing Nate Woody speak, uh, I think he kind of aligns with that sort of vision of of you know if you rush three or four and it doesn't get there, you you send five. If it's not five, it's six. If it's not six, it's seven. And I think so much of what Paul Johnson and the way he looks at the game is you know we play a ball control game. We're going to be pretty efficient on offense. You know, we can we can kind of control things in that way. If we can get a defense that will we'll get a turnover or two and and force some fourth down, force some punts, then we're really going to kind of gain control, gain leverage over the game, over the game. And I guess that probably speaks true for for most teams, but I think especially so with with this offense. And so I think because it's maybe of a kind of a a high risk, high reward sort of scheme where you know you acknowledge, okay, they're going to burn us on some blitzes sometimes. Uh, maybe we're going to yeah play too aggressively and they'll hit us. But by and large, if we can get, you know, two tone reverse and, and, you know, force some, some three and outs, then that's really going to swing uh, the percentages to our side. And so I think that's really kind of the way uh, Nate Woody sees the game. And obviously, you know, with the first year coordinator in a new system, you're talking again about, you know, how, how well the pieces fit. And that'll be kind of remains to be seen that the secondary is really young. They, they lost all five starters from last year's team. So, uh, so some question marks, but yeah, there's, there's kind of, a lot of optimism, some energy on that side of just, you know, kind of what can, what can this group do? So for a guy like me who tries to keep track of everybody as much as possible, and I'll probably check in on Georgia tech, hopefully in week two against South Florida, that could be an Uh, interesting game. Yeah, certainly. Uh, when you look at the defense, I'd like to go in with a a couple names. Um, Mm -hmm. who's, who are the standouts, maybe anybody that you really like that hasn't necessarily had the opportunity yet, but needs to be an impact player this year. Um, well, I think the, you know, the, the probably one guy you think about first is Brent Mitchell. He's a, he's a, going to be a, a third year starter, um, middle linebacker. Uh, you know, he's, I guess it's funny. I guess like any, any player in the new defense or offense is going to be excited about it, but I think he's, uh, you certainly see that from him that he feels like it's a defense that can create more negative plays. And he's a guy that's around the ball, a smart kid. Um, and so he's one guy for sure that I think, you know, should, should, should do well. Um, the, another is, uh, Desmond Brandt to defensive end. He seems he was actually kind of someone who probably didn't fit the four, three as well, but as, as an outside, as an end in the three, four, uh, and, and particularly in the way that Nate Woody wants it, where they're relying more on speed than size. Uh, he, he could be a good fit. Um, another, a guy in camp who, um, who, you know, we're, we're going largely on what Coach Johnson and, and players are saying, but David Curry is a guy who hasn't had a lot of opportunity. He missed all of last year with a with a foot injury, but he's a guy that I think is, is coming along and, and could 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 impress. Um, Victor Alexander and Jaquan Henderson, they both play the kind of the rush end spot where I think you're expecting a lot from in a playmaking sense from from that position. And both those guys have you know, speed and, and hit, hit, hit hard. And so I think those are two more guys that, that you could hear from uh, this season. We're talking up Georgia Tech football. We've got uh, Ken Seguiara from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on the line. I want to remind everyone that if uh, you don't have time to check out the videos, we're on audio as well. It's the same production. It's the same uh, content. Google Play, Podbean, iTunes, and Stitcher. Just search Mark Rogers TV. And also, uh, you'll see in the description section that uh, we've got an Amazon product. Uh, you don't need to purchase that, but if you use those links that uh, helps the cause as well as our mailing list. Just uh, send your email to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail to get on the mailing list that starts week one of the college football season. So Ken, we, we talked about Paul Johnson's tenure there at Georgia tech mm-hmm. we can breeze through it. Uh, I did some coaches rankings in all the power five conferences. Mm-hmm. When I got to the ACC this summer, the, the other ones were easy to at least put in my mind before I looked at the metrics and, and put it into context. But the ACC was extremely difficult after the obvious. Right. <laughs> Abbo Sweeney at the top. Right. And 
I can't even remember where I put Paul Johnson. He was in this in the six or seven range, something like that. But when I looked at his tenure, I saw five or six out of seven ranked finishes to start his tenure at Georgia Tech. And besides that Orange Bowl season, uh -huh. it's kind of tapered off the last seven or eight years. Not a, a number of ranked finishes there. Right. Um, is there any dissatisfaction among uh, Georgia Tech uh, faithful? Um, I think probably in some certain pockets. I mean, I think you know it's it's hard to put a put a number on it, but uh, you know, for whatever degree, social media is is a barometer, and I, I don't know that it entirely is. But you, certainly, you hear from people that are. You know, when the team goes five and six, the first thing you do is blame the coach, you know, rightly or wrongly. And uh, consider obviously the Nils too, you got the, the three and nine season. And, and I can understand why fans would be unhappy about that. And I think, again, you know, that, that offense is such a lightning rod. It's easy to say, well, if we didn't do well, it's because of the offense. And you can certainly look at the numbers and make a case that, that maybe that isn't the case. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I think, you know, you, you, you miss bowl games in the, Two of the past three seasons, when they, especially when they'd had a long, I forget the number, but it was maybe 15, 16 years in a row they'd gone to bowl games. And so you take that away and, and so you can understand why there's some grumbling. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I, but I think to, I guess to answer your question, I think the people that matter, uh, starting with the athletic director, are, are in his corner and understand that, you know, Georgia Tech can be a really tough place to play. And, you know, for a number of years, they maybe they didn't have the facilities, things that a lot of other teams they're competing with uh, have had. Um, you know, there's always some recruiting challenges at Tech just because the curriculum is, is pretty is really tough. Um, so, yeah, so uh, there is some and uh, but, I, I, it, you know, probably more on the fringes than than at the core of, of uh, you know, of tech tech people and, the, you know, the decision makers. Ken, I would think maybe another factor in the angst uh, of the fan base would be in not putting those things that you mentioned together, but looking at the recruiting, what could be the recruiting base. Right. It's not Iowa or Nebraska where there are pretty high standards, but they're out where they need to run a thousand miles to get somewhere right. um, to, to find some players or Washington State, somebody like that. Uh -huh. uh, there are players all over the place. Yeah. They're on every street corner. They're... <laughs> necessarily with the academic standards and everything else in play, uh, not attainable to get those top end guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's certainly part of the frustration um, for, for fans that they had to look at the recruiting rankings and wonder why, you know, Georgia Tech can't uh, get the, you know, the four and five stars. And it's interesting. You look at like, you know, that again, for whatever recruiting rankings are worth, you look at the top 50 in the state of Georgia every year and, and tech will get, you know, one or two of those guys. Uh, and, and it's, you know, obviously it's who you think it's Alabama and Georgia, Clemson, Florida state, um, and schools like that, Auburn, they, they grab the majority of those guys, but then there's also, you know, people that come in from, from out of state and, and pick guys off. And so, you know, it, it you would think that, that would happen. I, you know, I'm, I'm not an 18 year old kid who thinks he's going to the NFL. So I can, maybe it's not as easy for me to, to kind of, it's easy, easier for me to think that, oh, well, I can't tech get those kids. And I, you know, I think part of it, you know, they're, they're part of it probably is facilities and, and things like that. And they, they just got a new Adidas contract and they'd been wearing Russell, which, you know, who knows exactly how much that mattered. But I think just in building the whole impression of what is Georgia Tech, if, you know, you, you want everything to kind of click. Um, and so maybe that's a little bit of it. Uh, so we'll see what happens over the next few years as, you know, they have a, a really nice new locker room. They've got the Adidas deal. You know the, you know a new coordinator that that people are excited about, and and we'll see what happens going forward. But yeah, you know it's uh they they are in a very very fertile uh, area of recruiting, and maybe maybe you know probably among the most in the country. Um, and uh, you know if you can just you know really get one or two more guys that can make a difference for you. We talked previously about how Georgia Tech's one of those teams that they need everything to hit. If you get a guy who can be a star and and maybe give you a little more margin for error that that kind of gives you a little more breathing room season to season. But, uh, but right now where they are, you know, they're not getting the, you know, the, the blue chip kids or, or very many of them certainly, you know, on a yearly basis. So amongst all the comments on the chat, there are two basic uh, lines of thinking that uh -huh. I'm going to throw out to you that are standing out here. One is um, kid kid in particular, and some others looking for possible freshmen that could make an impact could be uh -huh. standouts this year. Kicking game, he said. Uh, freshman. 
they could uh, stand out. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Um, you know, so uh, there's a couple. Uh, one is, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Quez Jackson, Jaquez Jackson. Uh, he early, enrolled early. He's a linebacker. Um, it's interesting, you know, you, you talk to some of the players about who looks good. Um, and, you know, both Brian Mitchell and David Curry, they, you know, it was clear it wasn't just I'm paying lip service because I have to talk about this kid today. things about it, but they really like the way he's playing. He's, he sounds like a really instinctual player, um, you know, and, and they, they're convinced, both of them, that he's going to play this year. So he's someone to watch out for. Uh, who else? Charlie Thomas, who also enrolled early. He's He kind of plays a, a hybrid linebacker safety spot. Um, that he should have a chance to play uh, among other freshmen. You know, one that's kind of interesting that the Bears watching, James Graham, who actually was, I think, probably the, the highest ranked kid out of Georgia to come to Tech. He came as a quarterback. He's a dual you know, run pass guy. But because of some injuries uh, at wide receiver, they moved him out there, um, I think, just for the season, um, just because they, they need some bodies. And I think he's someone actually could fit there. Actually, he was actually committed to Virginia Tech to play wide receiver there before he came to Georgia Tech. Interesting because in part he wanted to play quarterback, so we'll see kind of how that shakes out. But those are three names um, that that we've heard so far uh, about the guys that that could make the you know the uh, be on the field this year. Good stuff. So Ken, uh, the other question that's always asked, uh-huh. and I don't know if you've made your prediction this year, but people asking for uh, we'll we'll call it expectations. I don't know if uh-huh. you've made a prediction. Certainly, if you have, we'll take it. But uh-huh. uh, uh, in terms of the expectations of this season, how would you frame those as a good season versus a disappointment? Boy, um, you know, it, it's hard because, like, in some ways, if they win eight, win, if they win eight games in the regular season, you could say that's a pretty good season. Um, and, you know, it's they, they've, and they, even though it's kind of typically about where they've been, particularly with Paul Johnson when, they, when they've won, um, you know, but the the challenge is, you know, you the you got Georgia at the end, you got Clemson, uh, Miami, and then uh, Virginia Tech. All you know, so Georgia and Clemson obviously are their teams that are, people are picking for the, the the playoff, and then Clemson and Miami. Or excuse me, uh, Miami is actually another team that could get up there. Um, they're loaded. They're getting better. Virginia Tech should be in the top twenty five, um, and then you know. And then you get you throw in USF, which you don't know who, how they'll be. But so that's that's four games though against against really good teams. And if you win one of those, you have to think, well, they're you know they're they're not in the top twenty five. If they beat one of those three, then it, in some ways it can another success. But you know that's so. But if you so if your ceiling in a way that we're talking about is is nine wins, then you know what does that kind of leave you? You could be a really good team. And I think that I think they will be just um in terms of who they are, you know, qualitatively they'll be better, but it could be a nine or eight win season, which and I think a nine win season really would, would be fantastic. I think a wood season, I think would be good. Um, you know, you get down to seven, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, if you win one of those four and you play a team like Duke, which has gotten better, Carolina should be better. Pittsburgh's no gimme. Um, Virginia seems to be getting better. gives gives like a tough time. So it's, uh, it's kind of those things where tech can win a lot of those games, but they could also lose a lot of them. So there's maybe you could tell it about a lot of teams, but there's, kind of a lot of kind of a, a wide range of, of what could happen and, and what could be. So, but I would think, yeah, if, if they get to nine wins, I think you have to get a, a, a great success. Eight wins, I think is, you'd call it a good season. Yeah, I ranked it as a uh, top 20 schedule in the Power Five. Um, yeah. As you well know, uh, with a rotation and the designated rival in the mm-hmm. other division, Georgia Tech has yeah. to play Clemson Josh every year. They've turned out to be the the team in the in the conference. And yeah. then on top of that, it just seems as though currently and to a certain extent historically, Miami has the best talent. They're on tier one, even though they finally – won a division championship and then Virginia right. Tech slots second and mm-hmm. then you have this mishmash of right. programs that um you know obviously Georgia Tech won the division a few years ago Duke won it uh and a number of other teams have stepped up and, and challenged like Pitt wow. North Carolina in particular so you know a lot of teams that you typically see as seven and five eight and four type teams typically uh in, in that coastal division very interesting all right uh, Ken Sigiara from uh, the Atlanta journal constitution stopping by for the first time here at mark rogers tv ken we appreciate the time and so yeah. uh, you can stop by uh, anytime you're you're always welcome a great breakdown 
on uh, the Yellow Jackets for us as we get uh, set for Alcorn State in week one. And again, a sneaky good one in week two with South Florida and that yeah. game on the road for the Yellow right. Jackets. Yeah, yeah, it's a noon kickoff, and they've already started talking about just they got to be ready for that heat. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, thanks for having me on. It's, it's, uh, you know your stuff, so it's always fun talking with someone that, that's, that's, uh, that's done their homework. Thanks so much, Ken. Uh, 11.45, Matt Moscona, ESPN Radio, Baton Rouge in New Orleans to talk LSU as well. And 2 o'clock, Tim Aiden of Black Shoe Diaries on the SB Nation platform for Penn State. Thanks so much, Ken. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, Mark.